Time Wing briefing on yeah, religious yeah. minorities in the Near East and South and Central Asia, hosted by uh, the Tom Lankos Human Rights Commission. My name is Elizabeth Hoffman. I'm the Republican Director of the TLHRC. And we are very grateful to have with us today for um, witnesses, the first Masab Youssef, author of Son of Hamas, who I'm sure many of you um, are familiar with his work. I'm Jawad Khan. Uh, he's a representative of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community in the United States. Um, some important developments with the Ahmadi has been happening in Indonesia just over the last couple days, so glad to have you here today. Uh, Dina Gerges with the Washington Institute for Near East Policy going to talk about some of the recent developments with the Coptic community in light of all the changes happening in Egypt. And um, last but not least, Janus Alpert from the Baha'i community um, of the U.S., who will give us a brief overview of what's happening with the Baha'is in Iran and throughout the region. Um, without any further ado, I will let um, Masab start, and then um, everybody's going to give five to ten minute presentation, and then at the end, time permitting, we'll take some, we'll have some time for question and answers. So. Thank you, Elizabeth, and uh, thank you for being here. Um, my name is uh, Musab Hassan, and uh, I'm originally a uh, Palestinian from uh, the Palestinian territories. I moved to the United States four years ago, and uh, a year ago, I wrote uh, a book, Son of Hamas, about my life story. In fact, uh, today is the uh, anniversary of uh, the first uh, uh, year for publishing Son of Hamas. Um, as a convert from Islam to Christianity, I want to talk in this uh, area. I'm not an expert about the religious minorities in the Middle East, but I can talk through my uh, experience and through my uh, uh, life living uh, as a Muslim, then converting to uh, Christianity, not as a religion. Uh, but at least uh, leaving Islam and turning my back to my uh, father's uh, belief. Simply, I lost everything. I lost uh, my family. I was disowned by my uh, father. I cannot talk to my mother today. I cannot talk to my uh, father. Uh, my, grandfa my grandmother died uh, a few months ago and I couldn't uh, call my mother to say I am sorry for that. Um, the reason, not because I, there is no possible way to talk to my mother, but if I talk to her, she would be in danger. From who? Maybe from the Palestinian Authority, maybe from Fatah movement, from Hamas, from the entire society, who consider me as infidel today. And uh, it's very sad to be here today to talk about the religious minorities and uh, to be persecuted not by ma the majority of people, to be persecuted by the religion itself. I know that this is not the problem of people, this is the problem of their entire belief system. Uh, when, when the prophet of, uh, of my people says clearly, Whoever changes his religion can him. So people need, uh, people have no choice but to obey their uh, prophet. And uh, today I'm a victim of uh, not uh, the people, but the entire belief system that uh, I'm trying to expose and uh, even if I have to uh, fight. Uh, we have hundreds of thousands of Muslims who leave Islam every year. Uh, we, have, uh, uh, we, we have been in touch with them. We know who they are. We have, from Egypt, before this event that happened in Egypt, we have uh, at least uh, 50,000 uh, converts that uh, contacted us. They left Islam, but they cannot share their new faith with anybody. They don't want to lose their uh, families. They don't want to disappoint uh, the hearts of their parents. And uh, it's very hard to see that people cannot have their freedom. 
And uh, in the, when we talk about the Middle East and North Africa, yes, all the time we talk about maybe uh, the majority of people persecuting the minority, but unfortunately, we uh, don't understand that the God, the Prophet, the entire belief system of that society is persecuting uh, uh, the people in general. Um, uh, I witnessed uh, the death of myself, uh, the death of uh, uh, Christians who convert to Islam and Muslims who convert to Christianity in my town, Ramallah. My town is a Christian town, and uh, there were, where I grew up. Um, and uh, people simply were killed because they changed their gods, or they said, we don't believe in this God, we want to believe in something else. So there are events um, on uh, uh, almost in every uh, city. Uh, recently, uh, there is an escalation uh, of uh, this uh, type of uh, uh, violence. Uh, in Iraq, we all heard about uh, uh, the massacre that happened in a church. Uh, many people were killed and uh, wounded. And uh, recently, uh, we heard what happened in Egypt. Uh, some uh, terrorist group uh, uh, killed uh, many Christians in uh, Iskandaria. I think uh, other uh, speakers will talk about uh, this in specifics. All I can say that this is, uh, uh, we need somehow, we need somehow to protect people in general from the authority of religion itself. Before we start to talk about uh, religious minorities and religious uh, majorities in the Middle East. The highest authority of that region is for religion itself. And uh, this is the time we see what's happening in the streets. This is the time to bring the strength to a solid, strong constitution that will protect the rights of majorities and minorities at the same time. Not to give the authority of a uh, uh, certain religion over the constitution and uh, other uh, religions. I think this is uh, the best way uh, to uh, deal with this uh, situation that's happening. Um, uh, I, I don't have uh, much to say. All I can uh, add that uh, today we have a great opportunity using the social networks that has amazing authority uh, in the Middle East and in the world. And you know, uh, I, I, I believe that uh, Facebook might have authority uh, or more authority than any government today. In fact, you see lots of uh, uh, officials, they're uh, in a competition to just uh, have a Facebook page and uh, everybody wants to be on this uh, type of social networks. Using this media to connect with people, educate them, challenge them, and build bridges of understandings uh, will help uh, reduce this type of uh, uh, religious uh, violence and uh, educate them uh, to trust in a, a liberty and a freedom that is protected by a very uh, strong uh, constitution. This is all I have to say for now, and uh, I will uh, be uh, more than happy to answer if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. You guys can hear me okay? Great. Um, well, I'm really honored to be here. Um, my name is Amjad Mahmoud Khan. I'm the National Director of Public Affairs uh, for the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community in America. Uh, by profession, I'm an attorney at Latham & Watkins, uh, a senior litigation attorney. And um, I was at the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission a few years ago uh, testifying at a, in a hearing context um, on the uh, persecution of the Ahmadiyya community in Pakistan and in particular the Pakistan's uh, anti-blasphemy laws and um, their legality. Um, today um, my presentation is, is much more uh, broad, uh, focusing in on the plight of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community uh, in the Near East, um, in South Asia, but also in Indonesia, which is uh, fresh in the news and will be a, a key point of the testimony. Uh, by training, I um, was the editor-in-chief of the Harvard Human Rights Journal and a, I'm a graduate of Harvard Law School, and I've spent a good part of my career uh, wrestling with these issues and writing about them. Um, I, I think that 
I want to begin by, by stating that the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is arguably the most persecuted Muslim uh, community in the world. That is to say, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community does believe that they are part of the Muslim community. They profess to be Muslim through and through, and therein lies the tragic result, as I'll explain shortly, particularly in Pakistan. The U.S. State Department, the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, and many dozens of international human rights organizations, particularly Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, have documented the systemic persecution of our community for many years. And the country condition reports are replete with examples of country-specific persecution. Uh, over the past decade, hundreds of Ahmadi Muslims have been murdered in Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Indonesia. Uh, in 2010, this past year, 99 Ahmadi Muslims were murdered in Pakistan. That's the deadliest year ever for the community. The persecution of our community is at an all-time high. Now before I get into some specific details about Indonesia, Pakistan, and the Middle East, I think it's useful to just introduce our community. Who are we? And once I introduce the community, perhaps it will be easier for, uh, for you to understand the source of, uh, or the reasons for our persecution. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community is a dynamic, fast-growing, international revival movement within Islam. It was founded in 1889 by Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, who is the founder of the Ahmadiyya community. And we are in 195 countries, and our population and membership exceeds tens of millions. The international headquarters of our community is in the UK, and um, our current successor, whom we believe to be our spiritual head it, uh, and uh, Khalifa, is uh, uh, Mirza Masrur Ahmed, His Holiness, who resides in the United Kingdom. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community is the only Islamic organization to believe that the long-awaited Messiah has come in the person of Mirza Ghulam Ahmad of Qadian, India. Ahmad claims to be the metaphorical second coming of Jesus of Nazareth and the divine guide whose advent was foretold and for whom all Muslims are awaiting by the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community believes that God sent Ahmad like Jesus to end religious wars, to condemn bloodshed, and to reinstitute morality, justice, and peace. Ahmad divested Islam of fanatical beliefs and practices by vigorously championing Islam's true and essential teachings. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community is the leading Islamic organization to categorically reject terrorism in any form. Over a century ago, Ahmad, the founder of the community, emphatically declared that an aggressive jihad by the sword has no place in Islam. In its place, he taught his followers to wage a bloodless intellectual, what he termed, jihad of the pen, an intellectual crusade to propagate his ideas. And to this end, he penned over 80 books, tens of thousands of letters, and engaged in many debates in South Asia. And his rigorous and rational defenses of Islam unsettled conventional Muslim thinking at the time. As part of its efforts to revive Islam, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community continues to spread Islam and its teachings of moderation and restraint in the face of bitter opposition from some parts of the Muslim world. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community is also the only Islamic organization to endorse a complete separation of mosque and state. Over a century ago, again, the founder of the community taught his followers, he wrote about this in his books, that you need to protect the sanctity of both religion and government by becoming righteous souls and loyal citizens. He cautioned against irrational interpretations of Quranic pronouncements and misapplications of Islamic law. He continually voiced his concerns over protecting the rights of God's creatures. And today, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community continues to be an advocate for universal human rights and for the protection of religious minorities. It champions the empowerment and education of women, and its members are among 
the most law-abiding, educated, and engaged Muslims in the world. Finally, the Ahadiyya Muslim community, what separates them from other Muslim organizations is the foremost Islamic organization with a leader, as I mentioned. Over a century ago, Ahmad reminded his followers of God's promise to safeguard the message of Islam through the institution of Khilafah, which is a spiritual institution of successorship to the prophethood. And the Ahmadiyya Muslim community believes that only spiritual successorship can uphold the true values of Islam and unite humanity. So since his demise, five spiritual leaders have succeeded him. And its fifth and current leader, as I mentioned, Mirza Masrur Ahmed, resides in the UK. And under the leadership of the spiritual successors, the Ahmadiyya community has built over 15,000 mosques around the world, over 500 schools, and over 30 hospitals. It has translated the Holy Quran in over 60 languages. It propagates the true teachings of Islam and the message of peace and tolerance through a 24-hour television program called MTA, Muslim Television Ahmadiyya, the internet on its website, alislam.org, and in print, Islam International Publication. And it also has been at the forefront of worldwide disaster relief through an independent organization, an aid organization called Humanity First. So that, in a nutshell, is the background of the community. It's important to understand this from what, I, for, for what I'm about to say, which are incidences of persecution against the Ahmadiyya community. And I begin with Indonesia. So about three weeks ago, more than a thousand extremists, mostly members of the Islamic Defenders Front, many brandishing weaponry, attacked the house of an Ahmadi leader in Chikasik, West Java. There were only 20 Ahmadis in that house. And they, these individuals beat to death the three Ahmadis in broad daylight as 30 police watched. Now, what makes this particular incident so severe is that it was, it was captured by Human Rights Watch. They secured a video and they released it and it went viral. And the video is extremely disturbing. Immediately after the video, Within 24 hours, the lead story in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Jakarta Globe, and many other papers was about this attack, this heinous attack. There were three Ahmadis who were killed, and I mentioned their details in the written testimony. Uh, all of them had families. Uh, the February 6th attacks were denounced uniformly by the U.S. State Department, by USERF, by the U.S. Ambassador to Indonesia, and they continue to be denounced since then. And we've uh, met with several of our officials. I'm just coming from a Friday meeting with our Assistant Secretary Michael Poser in his office about this particular incident in Indonesia. Now, this situation in Indonesia is not new, but it is quite severe and it's deteriorating rapidly. The Ahmadi community in Indonesia was actually one of the first communities that was founded before Indonesia was in 1925 and then had formal identity in 1953. There are about three, 250 to 300,000 Ahmadis in Indonesia. And what's happened there systematically, and without going into too much detail because time is short, but the 1965 blasphemy law, which affects Christians and other religious minorities and the Ahmadis, has led to a situation where Ahmadis, the, the, their activities are bordering on the criminal and the blasphemy law and the 2008 joint decree, which was passed by uh, three uh, departments in Indonesia, the Home Ministry, the uh, Religious Affairs Minister, and the Attorney General, they essentially said, the Ahmadi community, which has many mosques in Indonesia, you cannot propagate your faith. You are heretical. You are quote-unquote deviant. And this, as long as you are living quietly, then that will create safety in our country. Well, after they passed that decree, since 2008, June 9, 101 reported attacks have taken place on the Ahmadi community. It's at an all-time high. And this, from 2005 onwards, when the Ulama Council, the largest uh, and government-funded council in Indonesia, declared the Ahmadis to be heretics, since then, the attacks have continued. And they've been gruesome. There have been dozens of Ahmadis that have been killed, mosques have been burned, I happen to represent one of the first Ahmadis to obtain asylum. I did that case pro bono from Indonesia, a family of four, a journalist. And it was quite harrowing to hear his circumstances. Um, so 
And, but as I testify here today, just in the past 12 hours, just this morning, the lead headlines out of the Jakarta Post and the Jakarta Globe is that 2,000 of these members of the Islamic Defenders Front had a rally. And they said, they said, unless the president, or until and unless the president bans, formally bans the Ahmadi community officially, we will kill Ahmadis village by village until it happens. 1,500 police officers intervened this morning in this demonstration. And now the home uh, ministry, the immigration minister has called for the formal ban of the Ahmadi community in East Java, the regional governor has already banned the Ahmadi community. This is a defining moment for Indonesia. It is a, a temperature gauge. Where are they headed? They're, they're in a fork. There's a fork in the road. Whether they take the path of extremism or moderation, it's in the president's hand. And that he will have to make a decision very soon. Now, of course, Indonesia is one of the most moderate Muslim countries. But this is the moment that Pakistan also endured in 1974 when it chose the path of extremism and the Second Amendment through its constitution declared our community to be non-Muslim. And as I mentioned, there's been, actually there's been over 300 killings of Ahmadis since 1974 in Pakistan and now 99 just this last year. I wanted to touch on Pakistan in my final few minutes here. Uh, Pakistan is um, it, it's well known what has happened to the Ahmadi community there. And what, what's very worrisome for us is what will happen in Indonesia as a follow-through and what happened in Bangladesh. On May 28th, members of the Punjab Taliban attacked two of our mosques. We had hundreds of worshippers there and 86 people were gunned down. These, in, these included very young uh, teenagers. Um, my wife lost her uncle. Uh, many of our loved ones were killed in this attack. It was the deadliest attack on our community ever. And uh, since that time, there have been systematic attacks continuing with the Ahmadi community. And the Ahmadi community is essentially living a quiet existence there. The legal regime has set it up that Ahmadis cannot exercise their faith under the anti-blasphemy laws. If you say Assalamu Alaikum, if you call your Quran a Quran, if you call your mosque a mosque, if you call your grave site a Muslim grave site, you can be arrested, fined, imprisoned, and you can be sentenced to death. That is the current state of affairs for Ahmadis. In fact, the, the only Muslim scientist to achieve a Nobel Prize in Pakistan, Professor Abdul Salam, who is a member of our community, if you go to his tombstone, they erase the word Muslim from his tombstone. Um, it's the only English language uh, tombstone. And the second one is Choli Zafirullah Khan, who is Pakistan's foreign minister, one of the founding fathers of Pakistan in terms of his role, he too was branded a, a, a heretic in spite of all that he achieved for the country. So among the most literate, educated, enlightened citizenry of Pakistan, they are being subjected to this persecution. I won't go into all the details as to the, this blasphemy regime, because time is short, but four out of every ten arrests under the blasphemy regime are of the Ahmadi community. The Christian community is being sorely persecuted, as you know. We know about Asia, maybe. We know about the blasphemy case there. But what makes the Ahmadi situation different from the Christian situation are that Ahmadis profess to be Muslim. They, in or they are the only community that can't vote in Pakistan. And the way that has gone down is that President Musharraf reinstituted a, a joint electorate where all my minorities, Christians, Hindus, Jews, and Muslims, can vote for all candidates. That was Executive Order 7, but then three months later he said that system does not apply to Ahmadis. Chief Executive Order 15 effectively makes it, requires Ahmadis to declare that they are non-Muslim and they denounce their founder before they can vote. This is a block of several million educated Muslims who cannot vote in Pakistan. That's still true today. And I, I wanted to now turn very briefly to the Middle East which is the subject of this, uh, of this herring at South Asia is Egypt, which is in the news, has its own blasphemy law, Article 98F. Ahmadis have been arrested under that law. Their MTA programming has been banned. The president of the community spent several months in jail, along with nine other Ahmadis, as I've noted in the testimony. And in, in, in Palestine, the Palestinian territories, there's also increasing fatwas against the community. And one of the lead stories out of the Post last month were that Ahmadi marriages are being annulled. These are marriages between and among Ahmadi because they are deemed to be heretical. This is the state of affairs in a nutshell of our community. But our community is persecuted throughout the world. 
and um, I've only provided a thumbnail sketch. The source of this persecution, I wanted to stress, is a militant perversion of Islam, extremists who don't understand Islam's true and essential values. Um, I, I agree uh, that extremism is the source of the problem with my, uh, with my friend at Mossab. I, I depart from him on the view that Islam is the source of this issue. We believe strongly that Islam at its core, Islam that the Prophet taught, would never stand for this. International religious freedom is a human right, and Islam is consistent with that. It is an absolute tragedy that Islam has been perverted for these nefarious ends, and our community is bearing the brunt of that. But we, in our essence, are fighting to change that. The hearts and minds of those who are brought in here, too. We have 70 chapters here, and we are engaged in many campaigns to educate people about the true Islam. I welcome this forum, I welcome this briefing, and I thank you for your time. Hi everybody, um, good afternoon. My name is Dina Gerges. I'm uh, a fellow at a think tank here in town. Um, I'm also Egyptian American and I happen to be Coptic. Um, Copts are the Middle East's largest Christian minority, um, so today most of my talk will be focusing on them and their plight, uh, especially as Egypt takes uh, a lion's share in the news, is undergoing, it just underwent a revolution, as you know, and is currently undergoing a transition putatively to democracy. Thanks, Elizabeth, very much for having me. Thanks to the Commission for continuing to show uh, support and concern for the plight of uh, religious minorities in the Middle East. Um, I last testified uh, before the Commission a little over a month ago on Egypt's sectarian situation, which is what I'll be focusing on today. Um, since then, Egypt has had a revolution, as I just said. At that hearing, I stressed and concluded that Egypt's minorities problem was inextricably linked to the country's overall severe democracy deficit. That remains more than ever the case today, despite the occurrence and initial success of the genuine people's movement for freedom and democracy. By the way, can everybody hear me? Okay. Yes? Okay. Um, Egypt's revolutionary goals of freedom, economic opportunity, and dignity have been initially met in the form of the departure of President Hosni Mubarak, who ruled the country for 30 years with a draconian emergency law which suspended basic constitutional protections. The Mubarak regime was known for its human rights abuses, including but not limited to a pernicious divide and conquer game that permitted and encouraged the climate of sectarian tension to grow. This manifested in a range of government sanctioned policies, from outright discrimination and abuse by the regime's security apparatus to complicity in the face of sectarian violence when it broke out among Egyptians. Through circumventing the rule of law, the Mubarak regime ensured that nearly all acts of sectarian violence, particularly those directed at Christians, would be crimes of impunity. Through the heavy handed, threatening intervention of the Mubarak regime's security forces, Victims were compelled to relinquish their claims to any legal remedy, including for felonies, in direct violation of the Egyptian Penal Code. In many cases, security forces were active in persecuting minorities themselves, as in cases where Ministry of, of Interior officials requested Christians to suspend their right to worship so as, quote, not to offend Muslims. On a national level, the Mubarak regime severely restricted the rights of Christians to build and even repair Christian houses of worship. Relying on an antiquated Ottoman law, while in the meantime encouraging, of course, the construction of mosques. This policy came to a head last September when government security forces opened live fire on peaceful demonstrators, protesting the state's continued refusal to grant a license to build a church extension in the Omranea district of Cairo. This attack by government security forces left two, including one 19 year old boy, dead and dozens injured. Additionally, Mubarak's regime systematically excluded Christians from leadership positions in government, including in key sectors such as the security apparatus and the military and public educational institutions. These acts and more were emblematic of what had become routine established practice, with Mubarak using the prospect of change, which it was argued would inevitably bring extremist elements as a threat to induce acceptance of the status quo. This worked for a while. The strong showing of Christians during Egypt's revolution, however, holding Christian masses in the now famous Tahrir Square, the images of which you saw all over the Western media for the past month or so, standing in solidarity with fellow Egyptians who happen to be Muslim, represented and continues to represent a real turning point and opportunity for Egypt, 
an opportunity to build a civil state that extends equality to all its citizens, regardless of religion, gender, or any other differentiating category. Along with the promise of positive change, however, comes the heightened need for protection of minorities during this critical transition stage. Since the departure of Mubarak, there have been alarming signs on the sectarian front that warrant our attention. On February 22nd, for example, after the completion of the initial stage of the revolution, the Egyptian State Security Court in the Qunab Governorate of Upper Egypt acquitted two of the three suspects in the January 7, 2010 Christmas Eve massacre in the town of Nega Hamedi, where six cops between the ages of 16 and 24 were shot and killed by Muslims in a drive-by shooting. The cops were killed as they filed out of church after celebrating the Coptic Christmas Eve midnight mass in Nega Hamedi in Upper Egypt. And Upper Egypt, by the way, is an area which has been a hotbed for sectarian violence for decades now. While well, one of the three defendants was sentenced to death by this same court this past January 16th, the other two were subsequently acquitted, leading to the perception that the initial conviction resulted from both domestic and international public pressure and scrutiny in the aftermath of this New Year's Eve Alexandria church bombing that left at least 25 Christians dead. The subsequent acquittals of two men, previously recognized by that same court itself as having been accomplices to the heinous murders, restored the sense of insecurity and inequality Christians have felt for decades in Egypt. After the acquittal, Bishop Cyril of Nega Hamandi, for example, was quoted as saying, this is why we know that in Egypt, the blood of a Christian is worth nothing. After the verdict, one of the lawyers for the victim's families, Ivan Sobhi, said, quote, Due to the present circumstances of lack of adequate security, namely resulting from the revolution, none of the accused were brought to court, and families of the victims and the media were absent. The court seized the opportunity of the present circumstances and quickly handed down this verdict, end quote. So he talked about the hundreds of calls he received after the verdict, expressing disappointment and fear for Egypt's future, saying, quote, most comments I got from those people were that everyone thought that after the January 25th revolution, things would change. But unfortunately, corruption is rooted to the core everywhere. And herein lies the first challenge of the revolution and Egypt's future government, to uproot the core corruption that permeated the state's institutions, including its courts, and to restore the rule of law and a new constitutional framework that guarantees equal citizenship and to restructure state security in such a manner that its employees understand their role as protective of all citizens rather than abusive to them. It is unclear, however, that those currently in charge, namely the Egyptian Armed Forces Supreme Military Council, the SMC, which assumed the country's leadership after Mubarak's departure, understand this challenge and understand the need to extend protection to the vulnerable including minorities, during this sensitive time. While governance is not within the military purview, no one expected the military to undertake active action against vulnerable religious minorities at this time, which is exactly what happened on February 23rd and again on February 24th when the Egyptian armed forces stormed the 5th century monastery of St. Bishoy in Wetin Natun and the St. Macarius Monastery of Fayoum. Eyewitness reports confirmed by grisly videos taken of the attack and uploaded on the internet, um, one of which I wanted to show to, to you today, but there wasn't the, the capacity for that, um, show at least five tanks, armored vehicles, and a bulldozer in each separate attack on the monasteries. The armed forces undertook these actions under the pretext of, quote, destroying illegal fences built by the respective monasteries last month. These fences were built by the monasteries to protect them from the chaos and the looting that unfolded during the initial stages of the revolution, as many of you saw in the news, when pro-regime forces, wow, that's loud, um, when pro-regime forces um, uh, unleashed uh, uh, prisoners uh, from the prisons and unleashed thugs to threaten people and to frighten people back into submission and away from the streets. In both attacks on the monasteries by Egypt's military, 
Live ammunition was used. These are unarmed uh, Christian monks, name you. And several sources, including the videos, confirm the army's use of RPG ammunition against the unarmed monks and the monastery workers, leaving at least three monks and dozens of monastery workers injured, some in critical condition. The attack on the St. Macarius Monastery continued unabated for 30 minutes and did not confine itself to, quote, destroying the illegal fence. Army officers and conscripts stormed the inside of the monastery, destroying, bulldozing its gate, firing into its sign, and confiscating building materials owned by the monastery. Facts which undermine the military's pretext for the attack. Army conscripts were even filmed destroying trees on the monastery grounds. Inexplicably. Monks collect, then proceeded to collect dozens of bullet shells after the attack as evidence, which they understood would be needed to counter the expected denials from those in power. A denial which did, of course, inevitably come in the form of a statement from the Supreme Military Council denying the offense and referring to hackneyed statements of upholding national unity and holding to account those who would destroy Egyptian social fabric. The Supreme Military Council, in the meantime, has outlined and is moving forward on its, quote, plan for Egypt's transition. The Council has abolished Egypt's two national legislative bodies, both widely viewed as having been fraudulently elected, and has suspended Egypt's current constitution. It has opaquely chosen a constitutional committee to draft amendments to the current constitution. The amendments uh, were announced a couple of days ago. The amended constitution, according to their plan, will provide the legal, legal framework with which to hold parliamentary and presidential elections in June and August, respectively, to effect a civilian handover by October 2011. As you can see, this is a very, very short time period. It is unclear how this constitutional committee was chosen, and despite the fact that all its members are respected jurists, they are all men, and both its leading member and the, its only parliament, uh, parliamentarian were at some point affiliated with an Islamist orientation, with the latter actually being a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. Meanwhile, Egypt civil society and younger and newer opposition groups continue to demand fundamental changes, namely the appointment of a technocratic government to oversee the drafting of a new constitution enshrining the civil, non-religious nature of the state and respect for pluralism and human rights. Two, the provision of no less than a year, and preferably two to three years, to effect the transition, during which liberal political forces would be allowed, both through amended legislation and government practice, to have the meaningful opportunity to reassert themselves in Egypt's political landscape. Third, the restructuring of Egypt's notorious internal security apparatus, known for its systematic abuses against the Egyptian people, including torture and many other changes. They meanwhile view the Supreme Military Council's plan for transition and the rush to elections as likely to preserve authoritarianism, either by giving old regime forces a chance to reassert themselves in different form, or giving the Muslim Brotherhood an advantage in any election given, in any election given their organization, despite their lack of majority support among the Egyptian population. Numerous polls, by the way, were conducted after the revolution, which placed the support of the Muslim Brotherhood at 15 to 20 percent max. <clears throat> but the military seems unwilling to truly engage a broad spectrum of political forces during this time. It is undertaking opaque decision-making that seems to reverse Egypt's revolutionary trajectory and is causing alarm in Egypt in so doing. What is happening should give alarm to the international community as well. For if Egypt's peaceful revolution, which inspired the world at large, is hijacked and or subverted, we cannot continue to count on the use of peaceful means by the Egyptian people. What must be made clear is the support for Egyptians' legitimate revolutionary goals of creating a civil, democratic state. That will require continued popular pressure from Egyptians and vigilance over their transition. It will also require that the U.S. support Egyptians in bringing to life their vision. That means employing the tool, tools of leverage with the Egyptian military, indicating U.S. support for a measured transition to a civilian-led democracy that upholds human rights and not a rushed transition that preserves the authoritarian parameters of the Mubarak state. 
It means that during the transition, the international community should hold Egypt's military, now currently at the country's helm, to at least the same standards we held Mubarak's regime to in calling for respect for fundamental freedoms, including the right to assembly and to speech and worship. Just last Friday, uh, thousands of protesters filed again into the Hayyid Square, and by midnight, the remaining few thousand uh, were brutally attacked by military police. So really, we're beginning to see a rift between the Egyptian street and protesters and the Egyptian military, and we need to be uh, uh, very mindful of what's going on and follow that trajectory very carefully. Um, it also means that the success of Egypt's new democracy will have to be judged not only on its adherence to majority rule, but on its ability to protect the vulnerable, including minorities. This is especially true during the precarious transition when Egypt's cops, Baha'is, which we'll hear about more, and they are a very small minority in Egypt, and others are particularly susceptible due to the absence of trusted law enforcement, in some cases due to the absence of law enforcement, period. The Egyptian military should understand in no uncertain terms the interest the U.S. has in the upholding of these fundamental rights, and understand the U.S.'s willingness to support measured change that reflects Egyptians' aspirations for genuine democracy and Egypt's legacy as a pluralistic trendsetter of the region, which will serve as a model for surrounding countries. With that, I'll end, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. uh, I join the other panelists in thanking the Commission for having this panel to share these comments and open this discussion further. <laughs> um, what I'd like to talk about today are some of the comments we have about the crucial role the international community has played in defending the Baha'is facing religious persecution in the Middle East. I do this because I believe this briefing is about finding what works to champion human rights worldwide and about seeing how we can do more of that better. A major concern for Baha'is worldwide is the lack of religious freedom for Baha'is in Iran, where the faith was founded in the mid-19th century. Although Baha'is are committed to public service and they avoid divisive partisan politics and they're obedient to the government as matters of uh, religious principle, they're still perceived as a threat to the religious establishment in Iran. Uh, they constitute Iran's largest non-Muslim religious minority, numbering about 300,000. Uh, the fact that the Iranian Baha'is have survived the government's repeated attempts to eradicate them from the country proves to us that international pressure is crucial and effective in preserving our co-religionists in the faith's birthplace. And there's much history to support this. Oh. One example is the intercession by the Russian, uh, Russian embassy in Tehran in 1852, which spared the life of Baha'u'llah, the imprisoned founder <coughs> of the Baha'i faith. Uh, the Shah instead uh, banished Baha'u'llah, who experienced successive exiles from Baghdad to Istanbul, Adirne, and then to what is today Israel. And um, during these 40 years as a prisoner in exile, he was able to write 100 volumes, which today constitute the major teachings of the Baha'i faith. So you could say that at the very beginning of our faith, we learned the importance of international pressure in saving our community from extinction. There were waves of persecution over the course of the next century, which were also subdued by appeals to the Shah, including uh, some from the United Nations and President Eisenhower in 1955. But with the Iranian Revolution in 1979, came a regime seemingly impervious to international pressure. Uh, since the revolution, a total of 221 Iranian Baha'is, in most cases individuals serving in leadership positions in the community, have been executed or have simply disappeared. Thousands more have been wrongfully imprisoned, fired from government jobs, denied access to college, or um, stripped of their personal property. Still, we believe it could have been much worse without the UN resolutions, without the public statements from heads of state, such as President Reagan, or without the many resolutions passed by the US Senate and House of Representatives. In this light, the international community could be considered the Iranian Baha'is only recourse for protection. They are not recognized as a religious minority by Iran's constitution, and they have become the targets of a government-sponsored campaign to eliminate them as a viable community without necessarily killing them. You can read about this strategy to systematically strangle the Baha'i community in a secret memorandum written in 1991 by the Revolutionary Cultural Council and signed by Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei, which, and this document was uncovered by the UN Human Rights Commission in 1993. Currently, at least 62 Iranian Baha'is sit behind bars because of their religion. 
This includes seven Baha'i leaders whose case has come to represent the, the plight of the entire Iranian Baha'i community. All seven were arrested in 2008, six of them in sweeping early morning raids, which were ominously similar to episodes in the 1980s when scores of Iranian Baha'i leaders were summarily rounded up and either killed or never heard from again. For 20 months, the seven individuals were held without charge in Tehran's notorious Avin prison, uh, some of them with initial months of solitary confinement. Eventually, they were subject to an egregiously flawed trial based on charges of, among other things, espionage, propaganda against the Islamic Republic, and spreading corruption on earth. All false charges, typical of a regime trying for decades to vilify and defame Baha'is. Yet here, we see again the powerful influence of international scrutiny. These trumped-up charges carried sentences of capital punishment. But thankfully, so far, the lives of these innocent individuals have been spared. Their lawyers received the sentencing information orally, but it's understood they are serving 10-year prison terms. It's frightening to think about how much worse it could be without the responses of governments and civil society to the arrest and trial processes. Uh, however, Baha'is aren't satisfied. We adamantly call for the full release of these innocent prisoners. Um, this situation is still precarious. A few weeks ago, the five men among the uh, seven Baha'i leaders were moved to a section of Bohagash prison where political prisoners are kept and heavily monitored. Three of them are sharing a cell meant for only two, and their communication with the outside world through phone calls has been completely cut off. Also, the two women were sent to an underground portion of the prison reserved for the worst common criminals, and we have reports that already one has been threatened by other prisoners. In the case of Egypt, where the Baha'i faith has been established since the 1880s, the struggles with the computerized identification cards have seen some progress, but still remain unresolved for Baha'is. While Egypt's Ministry of the Interior decreed in 2009 that officials may issue IDs with a dash in the entry for uh, religion, there are still stumbling blocks for Baha'i married couples because of non-recognition of Baha'i marriages. We're hopeful the new government will soon resolve the issue completely. My point has been to emphasize that public statements by the international community, and particularly the United States government, do make a difference in combating uh, human rights violators. But I'd also like to draw your attention to the profound effect international support has on the individuals struggling under the oppression. Iranian-American journalist Roxana Saberi was imprisoned in Iran and for a while shared a cell with the two women in the Baha'i leadership. And she has said several times that news of the support worldwide really gave her hope to carry on in her struggle. And this is a gift we could give to countless others. I'd like to suggest three additional areas in which government and civil societal human rights efforts can also make a difference. First, we must find and create ways to counter the spread of misinformation. To give one example, the Iranian government has run numerous absurd articles about the Baha'is in the official k newspaper. These are meant to incite popular feeling against Baha'is and justify persecution. It would help tremendously if outlets such as Voice of America could increase measures to counteract some of this misinformation. This could result in a continued shift in public perception, and in some instances, change those who would be oppressors of the Baha'is to those who might even defend them. Uh, this is illustrated by a 2009 open letter titled, We Are Ashamed. Signs, uh, this was signed by hundreds of Iranian intellectuals and prominent people who came to realize that Baha'is are innocent victims of the Iranian government. Secondly, we must expand the opportunities for minorities to be present in dialogues throughout the world so as to undermine those attempts to demonize them. Third, we must be vigilant in using our diplomatic resources to head off attempts by governments to institutionalize or further institutionalize discrimination against minorities through the legal systems. Finally, I want to conclude with saying that how government treats its most vulnerable minority foreshadows what could be the fate of all who are at the mercy of oppressive government policies. The reported attempts to control the protesters in Iran, such as arbitrary arrests, monitoring their movements, demonizing them in the media, linking them to Western employees, and holding them in prison illegally are all tactics that have been used against the Baha'is for decades. It's our belief that the Baha'is will continue to be the canary in the coal mine that warns Iranian people of what lies ahead. If the situation of the Baha'is continues to deteriorate, the same can be expected for the general population. On a more positive note, the reverse is also true. If Iran were to begin respecting the rights of Baha'is, it would signal a change in government policies, which would be felt in Iran's foreign relations and in its relationship with its own people. 
Thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to our progress on this front. So I would like to thank our, um, all of our panelists very much for their wonderful statements. And before we move on to uh, the question and answer period, I just wanted to highlight a bill that was introduced by co-chairman, uh, the co-chair of the commission, Congressman Wolf, H.R. 440, which um, would establish an office of a special envoy specifically for religious minorities in these regions that we're talking about, the Near East and South and Central Asia. And we currently are up to approximately um, 40 co-sponsors, but still looking for more and hope to move this legislation to the floor as soon as possible. So anything that you all can do to help support these efforts would certainly be much appreciated. Um, but without further ado, why don't we go ahead and take uh, questions. And if you just maybe state your name and affiliation. Sure. Um, uh, Ken Timmerman, I'm with Newsmax. I also just returned from the Iranian border from northern Iraq. I've um, uh, been writing a lot about persecuted Christians and about Kurds and other minorities. Uh, Musab, I'm sorry I missed your presentation, but I wanted to ask you. It was a very short one. <laughs> well, yes, I'm going to give you the opportunity to expand on it. Uh, the, um, uh, the Iranian regime has very close ties to Hamas in Gaza. Uh, they have been funding the uh, uh, Hamas regime uh, almost from the beginning. Uh, how does that work religiously? We are told here in Washington by so-called experts on Islam that the Shia Iranis uh, cannot uh, actually work together with the Sunni uh, Muslim leaders, and yet, of course, they're doing so. So how does this work? Can you explain if, if you see any barrier between radical Shiite Muslim terrorists and radical Sunni Muslim terrorists? Is it just like off the topic or we can talk about no, this? No, no. That's fine? Okay. Yeah. Just want to make sure. Well, um, it's not it's all about politics. This is a very uh, good question and I think everybody who's uh, interested in understanding the Middle East uh, religious conflicts and political problem, we need to understand the conflict between Sunni and Shia. Sunni and Shia denominations have a very uh, bloody history. And Iran's main goal today in the Middle East to take over the entire Middle East region by bringing, by taking over the Muslim Sunni people, first of all. Second, to control the uh, natural resources and become uh, uh, an empire, one empire. Now, the reason that Iran supports Hamas and Gaza Strip to show the weakness of all Sunni Arab regimes, this is the goal, to embarrass them, to show the Muslim individual in that region that the leadership should uh, be uh, turned to the Iranis, not to the, uh, to the Shia Iranis, not to the Muslim Sunnis in the uh, Middle East. Now, Iran at the same time supports Hezbollah. I was part of uh, Hamas and I was very close to Hamas leadership. And uh, we have information uh, from Hezbollah how much they hate Hamas 